And uh, she has been the recipient of uh, South Region uh, Torrent Young Gastroenterology Award and the first prize for paper presentation from Women Doctors Association. And her areas of expertise is gastroscopy, colonoscopy, flexible sigmoidoscopy, self-expanding magnetic stent placement, acid reflux disease, ir irritable bowel syndrome, liver diseases, etc. Over to you. She will be talking to us about lower GI tract. Upper gastrointestinal bleed in a lot in every session. Even the lower gastrointestinal bleed has main importance. Let us go and hear something. Definition, causes, clinical findings, diagnosis and management, and some take home messages. So, coming to the acute lower gastrointestinal tract bleeding, it is classically present with sudden onset of hematochesia, either a maroon color blood or red in color, pass per rectum. It is usually defined as a bleeding from a source of from the distal to the ligament of trials. The lower gastrointestinal account for 20% of the all cases with GIP, approximately. 15% of the patients perceived to have a lower GI bleed or ultimately may be having an upper GI bleed. So hence, when you receive a case of lower GI bleed, it is our utmost duty to look for any upper GI bleed before we proceed the case. The incidence is around 20 to 33% of episodes of GI bleed and incidence increases with age. So it resolves spontaneously even if you don't treat about 80% of the case. Only few persons have a recurrence of about 25%. So coming to the causes, so whenever the bleeding from below the ligament of trites, so it includes the small intestinal bleed as well as the large intestinal bleed. Coming to the causes of the large intestinal bleed, common causes will be colonic bleeding, mainly of 95% of the cases, mainly it is of mainly of diabetic blood bleed. But we do come across most of the bleeds of hemorrhoid bleed in our sessions than the diabetic blood bleeds. And his ischemia around 5 to 10 percent in anorectal diseases, neoplasia of 5 to 10 percent, infectious colitis, and post polypectomy bleed following a procedure related, and inflammatory bowel diseases, angio dysplasias, and radiation proctitis and colitis, and recent improvement in our treatment of neoplasias and hemorrhoid bleed. Coming to the small bowel bleed, mainly of angio dysplasias, erosions, ulcers, Crohn's disease, radiations. Michael's diverticulum and neoplasia and IOTK and And to this talk, we'll take only about the large intestinal bleed and not the small intestinal bleed. So, coming to the colon, which extends from the cecum to the anal canal, many causes may be there. The commonest cause which we come across in our areas are mostly of hemorrhoid bleed and the neoplasia bleed than the diverticular bleed. Because many a times this diverticular bleed goes unnoticed because it stops by itself and many patients may not come to the hospital. And sometimes what happens, they may present with a massive bleed also. So how we are going to approach the patients? So any patient reaching to a hospital with a bleed should be an initial assessment with a resuscitation and going into the history in detail to find out what all they have and then start the localizing the bleed whether it is an upper GI bleed or lower GI bleed. It's simple to rule out the upper GI bleed by putting a nasogastric tube to look for any bleed in the nasogastric tube and we initiate the therapy according to the need of the treatment. So classically defining them the massive bleed. When the patient present to us more than 1.5 liters per day within 24 hours is a massive bleed. There is the moderate bleed. The patient may present with hematochesia or velina, but they are still hemodynamically stable, giving us room for time to think about the case and look into it and proceed the case. And the alcohol bleed is less than 10 ml of blood loss per day. In the alcohol bleed, the patient may present with melina only if they have the bleed more than 60 ml. If it is very less than 10 ml, which is goes unnoticed, can only be found by using a car test. So going into the history, age is much more important. Going an elderly person, we Cause, find more causes of the maybe of hemorrhoid or you may be having they may be having a painful bleeds or they may be having a neoplasia. In patients may have most of the time any ulcers or dysplasias and sometimes they may even present with esophageal viruses. So duration of the bleed is also more important whether it is a recurrent bleed or on and off bleed or it is only an acute bleed of a torrential bleed to be noted in topo. And the color of the bleed also gives us the clinch of the diagnosis and the quantity. So when the patient present with this blood and mucus in their motion, 
Okay, it is probably a colitis, a simple colitis of Escherichia coli or a Shigella infection still may present with an LGAB. And the fresh blood with splashes on the pan, it may be an hemorrhoid bleed. And maroon color blood is still a Merkel's diverticulum. The maroon color is due to the action of the acid hemidine. So it results as a diverticulum maroon color bleed. The red current jelly, which we read in our books in an early age, is usually seen in the name children with the intersection. And the bright red polyp in the pan may be probably a polypoidal lesions. And red sticks on the stool may be a fissures. These are the simple clues, clinches as the diagnosis and helps in the prognosis. So we can divide them as a painless bleed and a painful bleed. The painless bleed is usually a hemorrhoid bleed. Many a time the patient won't notice and suddenly one day when they have seen the laboratory, they come to us. Whereas the tumor bleed or angiodysplasia bleed also make many a time go unnoticed. When they flushes and nowadays using on western tech toilets, many a time many patients are not looking into their toilet. At least we should have a habit of looking our motions at least once a day in our time when we are going out so that we know what it is. The painful bleed usually reaches the hospital because they have an immense pain after passing the motion. Most of the time it is going to be our fissure in our So history by taking whether the patient is having an situation of abdominal pain or tenderness. So sometimes they, when they have the malignancy they may be having like a mass or a tenderness can be easily associated. If they have an anal pain and defecation pain, it may be a fissure in anal, which because of the anal tag or the sentinel pile, which has been cracked by a hard motion leading to pain. When the patient's an elderly patient presenting to us with altered bubble habits, when they're having a normal bubble habits here, here should think us to look into more into the causes to find out any malignancies underlying. If the patient is presenting with a chronic diarrhea, it should also be looked into it. Many a time they may be having a tubercular in the cecum, or sometimes they may be having a secret malignancy to be think about it. When the patient having any lesion in the rectum, usually they present with the misness because they feel an incomplete evacuation and they feel like passing again and again and they pass only the mucus, will should think about any lesion in either a polyp or a neoplastic lesion in the rectum. And the anorexia and weight loss and extreme tiredness, when we look into the rectal GNB and the hepatochesia, or sometimes they may be having a cord test positive with help us to clinch the diagnosis. So in the past history, whether the patient is having a previous history of bleed or a previous history of peptic ulcer, this is will also give us a clue whether the patient is having an upper GA bleed or any other thing. Any drug history. Nowadays we started using after the post-COVID, lot of antiplatelet drugs, which is causing us a lot of bleeding. Many patients to us reaching us should be taken into account. Any family history of Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, the bubble carcinomas and family history of any polypoidal diseases should be taken into account. The personal history of alcohol intake and smoking to be taken into account. So the risk factors when the patient is having an insert intake, whether the timely screening of cancers when the parents are having because in the older days, you have forgot to tell them that they should come for a cancer screening for the siblings. But nowadays we insist them to come for their family as well as the siblings for look for the polyps and the malignancies. And the use of alcohol and smoking to be also can take any doco. And in condition that lead to development of angioectasias, because nowadays we see a lot of the patients with iatic stenosis are presenting with angioectasias and they gone back from that to the diagnosis of iatic stenosis that we are coming across. So the symptoms, it may be an invisible bleed or an invisible bleed, either it may be a torrential bleed with black tawdy stool or sometimes like a hidden bleed, like the patient may present only with anemia towards. And sometimes the new onset of symptoms, I feel extremely tired, dizziness and faintness and they have been diagnosed only as an anemia and not looking deep into uh, the history. And sometimes if they are presenting with an associated symptom such as abdominal pain, difficulty in breathing and chest pain and light and headedness, will give us a clue they are having an anemia or an ongoing bleed with help us in clinch the diagnosis. Sometimes when they present with a massive bleed, they may present with a shock and it is easier for us to diagnose it. So, in the case of a bleed presenting to us, nowadays we should have a clear idea about the coagulopathies and anticoagulants and antiplatelet drugs, how to go about in a patient presenting with a bleed. Because decision regarding the management of the anticoagulants and antiplatelet drugs used in the individual patients to be materialized, to be fined in a court and not as a group. Because many patients having a life threatening coagulopathy, <coughs> With a prolong prolonged prothrombin time of more than 1.5 should be looked for a PTANR and if needed they can be given a protein complex concentrate or the platelet thrombin 
concentrates or the they can be given a fresh frozen plasma to control the bleed. Patients should be transfused for platelets if the platelet level counts are very low, less than 30,000 or if the patient is going to undergo a colonoscopy, their platelet count should be minimum of 50,000 should be taken into account. Nowadays, the targeted reversal agents. Nowadays, it is available in India, but it is very costly because it crosses around 2.4 lakhs to 24 lakh. Whether the drugs for either dabaratrin and anticoagulant or antidexin <coughs> alpha for apixaban, rivaroxaban, which has been widely being used post COVID as an antiplatelet agent for the patients. The platelet and the plasma transfusion should also be considered in the patients to receive when they are receiving a massive RBC transfusion that is more than three packs per day. In all the cases, the risk of reversing or holding an anticoagulation should be weighed against the risk of continued bleeding without reversal to be taken into solely in each patient in a different area, whether they have been stented recently, everything should be taken into account. Or we can talk to the primary physician who has started the drug, whether it can be reduced or not. So it should be always a group practice to discuss with the people from that they have come to us. So the predictors of severe bleeding. <coughs> so when they reach us, when they present with hypotension, tachycardia, syncope, and non-tender abdomen, and bleeding less than four hours, whether ASAF, use or any other comorbid conditions of more than like hypertension and diabetes. If there is more than three risk factors, then the risk of bleeding will be more of more than 85%. If it is slant, it is less than 10%. So coming to the investigation, we'll start from the baseline investigations like complete blood count, which will give us the clue. We are looking only for the hemoglobin. We should also know to read the MCV and MCH and MCHC which will give us the clue whether there is an iron deficiency or not, and looking into the reticulocyte count, whether there is an ongoing bleed, which leads to the more production, everything should be taken into account when we are reading the complete blood count. And the any other electrolyte imbalance when the patients have a chronic diarrhea, whether the potassium low or magnesium low, also to be taken into account, the blood urea levels. The blood urea levels will be very high, whereas the creatinine will not be increased when the patient is presenting with an acute GI increase. Whereas if they have a chronic bleed, the other things will be which also be taken into account because many times when the patient reaches may not have a bleed and they say we had a bleed in the home. When we examine, we may have only yellow tubes. And the coagulation profile to be looked into. The liver function test to look for the decompensated liver disease should be looked into account because they may have not only an upper paracel bleed, sometimes they may have even a lower paracel bleed also. Nowadays, we commonly routinely come across even the ventral viruses presenting with the bleed. So the blood group and cross matching to treat them. Nine profile is needed. The stool examination to be done, look for the basic investigations of OVA system works, and the occult blood for occult blood in the motions. And the barium enema nowadays we are not using much, but still we use the rectal enema to look for the colon because many a time when we send the patient for the contrast in CT, the people are not waiting until the contrast reaches the colon and the rectum. So in such a case, you can ask them to look for the rectum. If you suspect a lesion, we can ask for the to do even the rectal enema to find out the cause. And the proctoscopy to look for the pile and sigmoidoscopy for the sigmoid diseases and colonoscopy to look for colitis, carcinomas and polyps and small bowel enemas for enterprises. So the boy positive stool, it does not provide any localizing information. It says if the patient is having an ongoing bleed or not. So we want to look into them and take out the proper history and look more to find out the cause for the rectal GA. So the Okanan score, which has been already started practicing for the LGA bleed when they present to us, whether to treat them in the hospital or when they send them home. So it basically think about the patient's age, the previous LGA bleed, what is the finding in the digital rectal examination, the heart rates, and the systolic BP and the hemoglobin concentration. When the score is less than 8, the patient can be treated as a healthy basis. When the score is more than 8, we usually admit the patient for evaluation. So the endoscopy measures to look in the patients when they have present with the bleed. It may be a gastroduodenoscopy to look for upper GA bleed and the proctoscopy, colonoscopy, colonoscopy or either a capsule endoscopy and radiological evaluation like technician level scan or CD angiography. So we'll look some of this. So when we are classifying the patient with LGA bleed, it is based on the duration, whether it is an acute or chronic. Acute is of recent duration, is less than three days, whereas a chronic is for more than several days, based on the presentation, whether it is an over frank metathesia or occult presenting with a positive and unexplained diarrhea, an obscure GAP. So it can be an occult or overt.
So in the case of the carcinoma of colon, you can see the malignancy is started bleeding, can be taken into account in the diabetic lab bleed. Many a diabetic lump may have a bleed or may not have a bleed, who is present in constipation. The hemorrhoid bleed, when we do the table over of the colon, to look for the hemorrhoids, and if it is more there, then either it can be better or given to the surgeons, and the fissure in nano to be looked into. In the case of ulcerative colitis and uh, IBD, the Crohn's disease, the patient always present with blood and mucus will help in clenching their diagnosis. So the first picture shows the normal colon look like, the second one is a diagnosis, the third one is a Crohn's disease with cobblestone appearance, and third is ischemic colitis, and fifth one is the malignant bone, and the sixth one is an angiodysplasia. So going into the colonoscopy, it may be always an investigation of choice when the patient is present with an LG, with a stable hemodynamically, where we have time to prepare the patient with a pargadius at 2 to 4 liters, and sometimes 6 to 10 liters after the colon is clearly washed to the The diagnostic yield of colonoscopy is only 48 to 97 percent. The bowel preparation, it should be adequately prepared, and the intubation time, time taken to travel to reach the cecum. Because many a time we may not be able to reach the cecum because of any procedure abnormalities, either the patient uncooperativeness, many things may be there, but achieving the cecum will be the best part. The timing of the colonoscopy, especially the early colonoscopy, within 12 to 24 hours of admission, the clench in the diagnosis and early hospitalization and early discharge will help the patient. And sometimes the diagnostic yield is very good when they have done in a very active state. And in a patient with a serious or comorbid condition, we want to stabilize the patient. And in that time, we should do the radiological evaluation before the colonoscopy. So advantages of air in the colonoscopy, it helps in direct visualization of the bleeding sites, helps in localize the bleeding, and can decide how can we approach whether to take a biopsy or to go back with the therapies of medical therapies. So visible clots or everything will help us. And the therapeutic intervention will always help. So endoscopic therapy in the case of the colonic bleed either may be an injection, a dermal coagulation or either using a mechanical devices. The injection is the same, the same old injections like using a vasoconstrictor, either using an adrenaline, 1 in 10,000 or a glue injection. So locating the place where it is bleeding either it is a diverticulum or it is going to be an ulcer or a post polypectomy, we can approach it. So contact methods. Nowadays we have the heat probes or we either using a molecular or bipolar pottery to fortify the localization of the bleed area. But the complication is if we can have a perforation, which is less than 2.5%, when it is properly used, we cannot may be able to do it. The non-contact methods may be an argon plasma coagulation. In high level nowadays, we even use started using laser and high energy to coagulate the tissue for preventing the bleeding. So the mechanical devices used for active bleeding or to secure the definitive so either it, it using a clips or the bands from where it is bleeding. So the clips are placed so close to the bleeding vessel and the clip will be there for two to four weeks before it disappear from that place. And the bands may be used for the hemorrhoid bleed where the patient cannot undergo surgery at the neck of the lesions. In the diabetic lab bleed, we use the scope to catch it, suck it and put the clip so that the bleeding vessel lock inside the clip. Whereas in the post polypectomy bleed, where the patient undergone a polypectomy, because during the polypectomy procedure, before the preparation will be colonoscopy, so the patient will have minimal hypotension while during the procedure. Sometimes within 24 to 48 hours, the patient may bleed in a post polypectomy. In such case, we should do a re endoscopy to look for the bleed and arrest it. So, rubber band ligations is being used for the hemorrhoids. And the hemospray powder, which is newly invented, it actually comes in contact, this powder, the canistin, this powder comes in contact with the bleeding area and forms a mechanical barrier, that's it. It doesn't prevent the bleeding or it doesn't stop the bleeding. We have enough time to evaluate the case to find out the bleeding, to approach either surgically or radiology. So the capsule endoscope. Oh, what is the role in the capsule endoscope in the large bowel pain? Because sometimes when we do the full colon, we don't find the bleed, but the patient says we have humpy amount of the bleed. So it may be either an angiodysplasia or any other bleed or a clean ectasia which we may not find in our normal colonoscope or sometimes an obscure DAP cannot be found if using capsule. Then in such a case we use a capsule endoscope which is a small capsule which is about 26, point, 26 millimeter we can swallow it. It travels usually take time for 8 hours. Usually we fix it from where we should take a picture.
future, whether we want in a small boat or we want in a large boat. But the disadvantage is it sometimes travel very fast, so it may not take a enough picture which we need. Normally, it takes either a single image per second or two images per second. When it travels over eight hours, it takes around 60,000 pictures. But we need a long time to sit and look into it, so the people should be trained to look at to find out where the lesion is. But the disadvantage of the capsule is it is able to localize the place, but we cannot do any therapeutics. Either the, again, the therapeutic starts either with the entroscopies or with the colonoscopies. <coughs> so the CD angiography. If the patient is very unstable, but still the patient is bleeds, we want to find the cause. Then we can go for a CT angiography. The diagnostic accuracy will be 0.3 to 0.4 ml per minute, and the sensitivity will be around 50 percent, and the specificity is around 90 to 95 percent. Identifying the site of the bleeding and etiology of the LGA bleed. The oral contrast is not needed, it's an advantage for it, but it's a diagnostic protocol because it can help us only the plan of the vascular anatomy, either an intervention or the surgery. So in the case of the CT angiography, where we come across the bleeding area, and the bleeding area is arrested in embolization, either by using a gel foam or a coils or polyvinyl alcohol. The success rate is around 44 to 66. The re-bleeding is about 15% in the case of high incidence of bowel ischemia. Then superselective embolization. Sometimes we may not find out. In the vasorectal region, the minute bleed may cause a small obscure bleed, which is patient keep on resting the bleed, and around the marginal arteries and distal intestinal arcades also should be looked into it. The radio nuclear imaging, when everything is failed, but still the patient present with anemia, all these are after the occult blood test is becoming positive. We want to find a cause. Whether we can either go for a technetium labelled RBC scan or we can use a technetium sulfur colloid scan. So, by directing help and directing only 0.5 to 1 ml, it is a radio laser techniques. So, it's highly helpful, but it localizes the area. It doesn't specify the place. It says in the upper quadrant, lower quadrant, right quadrant, left quadrant in this area. But only we want to do the nephroscopy and the colonoscopies and the surgical intervention to find the cause. So on the whole, when you have all the procedures like colonoscopy, angiography, and radio radiography, the colonoscopy has both diagnostic and therapeutic possibilities, but the only the poor thing is the preparation. Whereas the angiography, there is no power preparation is needed. The immediate cause can be found out. Anyway, to go for the therapeutic intervention, the patient should be prepared. In the radionucleates in geography, it is a non-invasive where the low, low GMP with ongoing bleed can be helpful in diagnosis. So the role of surgery, not the release, is indicated in an emergency, in a life-saving procedure, where we have inability to maintain the hemodynamically the stable patient, where they need more than three to four units per 24 hours, failure of available therapeutic modalities, and recurrence of the initial control of bleeding, the patient may be subjected for surgery. And in the surgery, if we know the lesion, either by the CT angiography or by the colon, then we can go for a segmental resection. If not, we should try to locate the lesion or the patient should undergo a total colectomy. So this is a basic model for the approach to the LGEP. So when we receive the patient, we sustain the patient, treat the shock, we find out whether they are stable or unstable. If they are stable, bleed with the positive, with the CT and do, either radiologically or colonoscopy can be attempted to cure it. If they are unstable patient, then we we'll find out whether it is a major or a minor. Minor, they can be discharged, go home, and prepare and do the colonoscopy. If it is going to be a major, then they will be sh shifted for urgent endoscopy and colonoscopy to find out the cause and treat them. So the take-home message is for the prompt resuscitation is the first step of management in the DLGEP, and colonoscopy will be the investigation of choice if initial evaluation is properly made, and angiography should be considered if the patient is unstable, and timely surgical consultation with surgical colleagues should be always built there to say our patient. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very clear ex explanation, madam. Any doubts from the audience? to Professor Alfonso and from Toronto, Canada and Professor Tim Lee from Dublin. He is presently working as a consultant neurologist and movement disorder specialist in Apollo Hospital, Maine, Chennai. Over to you, sir. He will be talking to us about the recent advances in the movement disorder treatment.
uh, uh, start with. Do you think cancer is curable? Please raise hands. Not, not curable. Not curable. Curable in medical terminology, not curable by any layman technology. Layman terminology. So, is cancer curable in stage 4 diseases? Please raise hands in medical terminology. Again, come again. Is cancer curable in stage 4? Not curable. Not curable. So, I don't see any hands coming up. So, this is what I'm going to show you in my presentation. So, cancer cure are we there then? That's going to be the next presentation for the next 10 to 15 minutes.
So this is one of the patients, very young lady, 38 years when she was diagnosed with, we could, uh, uh, she was not willing for chemo. Being an young lady, she did not want to lose hair or undergo the side effects of uh, chemo. And she was one of the executives in one of the big uh, uh, software companies. So we need to have her screen, luminal type, if not for this molecular test, she would have received only the hormonal therapy. But a luminal type is one which is strong estrogen positive and would not recur as per the histopathology of the INC. But considering her age and considering the guidelines, we did the molecular profiling. We were able to identify that she fell into the high risk category and because of that she nearly had a 12% advantage in the the treatment. So endocrine therapy and chemotherapy, the five-year overall distant metastasis free survival predicted for her was 88 percentage, but with endocrine therapy alone, she would have had the chances of survival lesser. So we choose which patients need to have chemo and who need not have chemotherapy. And again, coming to the stage four diseases. How, do, how many of you believe stage 4 breast cancers to be treated? Please raise your hands. Only one. How many to be treated? So nobody thinks that stage 4 should be treated? Stage 4 breast cancer patients can be treated entirely with tablets. Treatment of cancer is becoming more like treating diabetes, like treating them with tablets and seeing the patients once in 3 months. So that is how the evolution had happened in breast cancer as such. So these are the hormone positive stage 4 breast cancer patients who can be treated only with either one of these three tablets. All the three are available in India and based on the risk factor parameters and other we choose which would be the better drug. The second group is the aggressive group which is a HER2 positive group. HER2 positive breast cancer patients, again, in those days we were giving chemotherapy for all the HER2 positive breast cancer patients and prognosis was poor. Now, looking at the availability of subcutaneous injections. So, the spectrozumab and trastuzumab injection is can be given as a subcutaneous. No need for inpatient admission, no need for anything else. Patients can be administered wherever they are, in Tire 1 city or Tire 2 city or a, a village even. Somebody who knows to administer the Subcutaneous injection, that is more than enough for me to treat a HER2 positive stage 4 cancer patients. And subsequent line treatments like NHER2, the uh, other medications are all available and now we are also looking at using tablets for treating HER2 positive breast cancer patients. Coming to the chemotherapy, older chemotherapy drugs are all toxic. We are having more side effects and patients were not able to tolerate many of the chemotherapy drugs. Now, we do have this nanothermal technology or lipid suspension based technologies or the albumin bound medications So or, or combination medications. Just like how we treat common cold, we don't give three tablets, one for paracetamol, one for uh, cetrazine and one for uh, phenylephrine. It is all available as a combination medications. One tablet once or twice a day based on the dosage and the based on the body surface area is more than sufficient to treat cancer patients. And coming to the surgical aspects, nobody wants to lose a breast. Gone are those days when mastectomy had been rampantly performed. Nobody does or judiciously does mastectomy in the current era. So this is a 44 year old female who had a breast cancer and only a lumpectomy was done. So we need to choose which patient needs to go for which kind of surgery. Larger tumors, of course mastectomy, but now after the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we could still shrink the tumor and based on the tumor response, we could go for breast conservation therapy based on the volume of the breast compared to the tumor tissue. Age again is absolutely not a contraindication for uh, breast removal. Even a 75 year old female could safely undergo a breast conservation surgery and can retain the organ as such. So now coming to the reconstruction part. It's again not necessarily to remove the entire breast. We could also go for a latissimus dorsi reconstruction. There are other newer oncoplastic techniques which have been evolving. So all these newer techniques completely had changed the way uh, uh, women can be treated for uh, the surgical treatment. 
and of course some of the very advanced tumors. Most of our patients will say, they will try to hide. It's very common in most of the rural areas, but still we could give them a good quality of life by doing a palliative mastectomy. So nobody needs to be uh, shunned off that there is no treatment. We could still give them a good quality of life. So this is one recent technique which has been rampantly uh, not used, which is not used in many of the other uh, uh, fields. So this is called as the the sentinel lymph node biopsy. So generally we do have this level 1, 2 and 3 axillary lymph nodes. And in breast cancer surgery, axillary lymph nodes has to be removed. That was the teaching in the surgical side. But now, in a clinically node negative axilla, the entire axillary lymph nodes need not be removed. Only the sentinel lymph node can be identified by injecting the radionuclide dye around the tumor. And probe will be used intraoperatively to find out which is the node which is picking up the, uh, the uh, radioactive dye. So when that specific node is removed, for example if the dye is injected into the tumor, the node will be picking up in the, in the sentinel lymph nodes and only those specific lymph nodes will be identified with an increase on the uh, tracer accumulation. Only those specific lymph nodes will be dissected and they will be evaluated with the frozen section. If that frozen section shows that lymph node is involved, then the surgeon will go with a complete axillary nodal dissection. If it is not involved, the surgeon can safely omit further dissection. So that saves in a lot of post-operative lymphedema. So this is the single incision breast conservation surgery with central lymph node biopsy on a 47 year old female and the breast cosmosis is something which is coming up very new and post-operatively patients can be given radiation with equal results so there is absolutely no disfigurement, no loss of organ or no loss of sexual life as such. Next coming to the uh, lung cancer treatment. So lung cancer is something which is again now increasingly happening in most of our uh, urban population because of various other reasons. And gone are those days when the entire treatment is decided based only on the histopathology. Now initially we were looking at only the histopathology, whether it is a non-small cell carcinoma or a small cell carcinoma. Again, one step forward, we started to understand about adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma and other variants in non-small cell. Now, in the past decade, we are now looking at only the molecular driver mutations which are present in the lung cancers. So based on this molecular pathology, the NCCN guidelines recommend to do molecular testing in both adeno as well as squamous cell carcinoma and all these come under category 1 recommendations. So all these category 1 recommendations denotes that it is mandatory to do the molecular testing for any lung cancer, non-small cell lung carcinomas. Why should we do it specifically in stage 4 cases? It is because there are so many tablets available for stage 4 non-small cell carcinoma. So again, treating lung cancer is like treating diabetes. Find the mutation, if it is positive, there are many tablets. Prescribe the tablets and so let the patient come back after 3 months for the whole body pet CT scan to assess the response. And this is how the lung cancer stage 4 metastatic diseases are treated in this point of time. Coming to the, the gynex, ovarian carcinoma, again that's one of the, the uh, uh, common cancers in women. Initially it was only a debulking surgery. From DHVSO to omentectomy to lymph node dissections, now we have moved one step forward to doing hypex, hypex hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So what we need to do is a uh, place where an hypex is done, a surgical oncologist along with the gynae oncologist or the, the gynex surgeon to identify a properly staged stage 3 patient, preoperative patients to be evaluated for a metastatic workup and if identified as a stage 3, then hypex would definitely be a game changer. 
So these are the, the survival curves for patients who had hyper and just a deep resting surgery. We could see that patients who had hyper had a higher survival compared to that of only surgery. So what exactly is hyper? Hyper is nothing but having the heated saline mixed with cisplatin or mitomycin and installed intraoperatively within the resected cavity. So once the surgery is over, through the, the hyper machine, the heated normal saline with the chemotherapy is percolated throughout the abdominal cavity for about 90 minutes to 120 minutes. And then and the entire fluid is let out and the patient is uh, 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 planned for recovery. So this improves survival. Coming to all the other modalities in which patients do have a stage 4 liver metastasis. So there are many modalities which can be used for treating stage 4 cases, especially for the liver. So these are the tear, which is trans arterial radioembolization procedures, trans arterial chemoembolization, alcohol ablation, RFA and microwave ablations. So is there any recommendation again? Yes, NCCN recommends the use of yttrium 90 spherule based chemo for liver deposits. This is especially have been recommended for metastatic colorectal carcinomas. This is the picture of one of my patients who had tear with chemotherapy. So initial presentation was more of uh, liver metastasis. So this patient post tear and Folfox based chemotherapy uh, had a very good resolution of the disease. This was another patient who had a cecal mass and on a whole body PET CT scan we could see that the patient had extensive liver metastasis. So all this which is seen on this two dimensional black and white imaging of a PET CT scan shows pyelobar metastasis. So this is how the tumor looked on the CT scan, on the PET CT scan and this was the sagittal image. So post tear and chemotherapy, the liver lesions have completely disappeared and this patient is alive even on this day. So I think this picture was taken about two and a half, three years back and he is still doing good. Though we speak a lot about advances in treatment, always as of now, cancer has to be prevented. It's good to avoid having cancer as such. Coming next to the newer modalities, uh, looking at oncogenomics, there is a lot of artificial intelligence, robotic surgeries, immunotherapy and proton beam therapy is also is one treatment which is right now available in Chennai, in India. So there are newer modalities like gamma knife, brachy, the stereotactic radiotherapy, the tomo, cyber knives and currently the proton beam therapy. So all this time I have been talking about chemo. So having a radiation background as well, it helps me to uh, make you understand that these kind of focused radiation treatments can be delivered only to the tumor site and the normal tissues can be prevented from the radiation exposure. So this concept of proton initially started in 1946. That was the theoretical uh, proposal in 1946 and for that to be Medically implemented, it took nearly about 45 years to first have a proton beam facility in California. So what exactly does this proton does? It is, usually when the radiation is given, it is more on the surface. And when the tumor is say in an intra-abdominal or at a depth of a few centimeters or a few... Uh, uh, so the radiation, what it does is, lot of surface deposit happens in the conventional radiation and the tumor gets a lesser dose. So there should be a lot of dosage to deliver to the tumor. But what exactly happens in proton is the surface dose is less, the dose at the depth is more. So and absolutely there is no exit dose. So what the proton does is deposit the entire uh, radiation dose onto the tumor per se. So this is one picture in which the uh, radiation gets delivered exactly onto the tumor. So the tumor gets treated layer by layer 
exactly filling up the tumor area. There is absolutely no exit dose and there is no dose to the critical organs. That way we could prevent most of the tumor, I mean we could prevent most of the normal tissue radiation. So this is how the uh, radiation would, would look like. For example, this is a red color is the tumor area where the radiation dose is concentrated. In tumor therapy, the radiation dose covers the tumor area. There is lesser dose to the surrounding structures. When we are looking at proton, the entire tumor area is covered and absolutely no dose goes to the critical normal structures. And how does that help? It specifically helps in pediatric cancers. Children are the future citizens of our country. So we don't want them to have late effects of radiation because radiation per se can cause secondary malignancies. So we don't want our children to have late malignancies or late growth disorders and radiation can cause lot of other problems as well during the growth. So all these would lead to the uh, exit doses and causes radiation damage to the normal structures. Whereas in proton beam therapy, you could say that this is a child with medulloblastoma. For a medulloblastoma, the entire neural axis, which is the brain as well as the spinal cord, has to be filled. So the entire neural axis gets the radiation and absolutely zero dose to the remaining parts of the body. So these are the advantages of proton beam therapy. So this is the proton machine which we have it in uh, Chennai. <coughs> And this is the machine which is about three stories high and nearly about 400 meters long which treats the patient. So other linear accelerator machines are just one single room. But this is quite a huge machine which treats the patients. And uh, Proton Cancer Center has a site specific oncology practice. We are three medical oncologists who divide our sites and see our patients. So there's more uh, advantages for the patients and uh, have a uh, around the clock ICU there and robotic facilities which is coming up in other hospitals throughout the city as such. So thank you so much for your patience listening. May I now ask us now, is stage 4 cancer still curable? Please raise your hands. I could see more hands than better. <laughs> Yes, you regarding the terminology which you have used. Uh, treating a cancer like a treating a diabetes. I am sorry for the delay. Um, but I, I thought of uh, I can use my computer, but the USB C port is not available here, so I will do that. Okay. The first thing. Um, so when I finished my neurology training in 2014, you um, will be asking. I was very, very, much, very much interested in cardiology. I was trying for a year, and everybody told that uh, I got neurology seat. Neurology. <laughs> That's the first question. I asked a couple of people, yes, sir. Why are you doing this? 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 I was depressed. Okay, let's see. Let's see if I have an option. I joined. I finished the um, neurology. Then I went to Ireland and Ireland I joined in a couple of months for epilepsy and I am not interested in epilepsy. Then I was more interested in movement disorder. I asked uh, again my colleagues, so when I got a fellowship, so should I join? Hey, movement disorder, I'm not Parkinson's, I I was still again, I was upset. What am I doing? Am I going in the wrong way, wrong way, wrong way, wrong decision again and again in my life? But um, I'll show what we are doing it nowadays <laughs> because the science has evolved a lot. Are you in the right way, sir? I think I'm going in the right direction. <laughs> Still, just, I mean, the important thing is neurology has evolved, sir. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so he is a 15 years old man. Um, Present with bilateral traumas for five years, very slow in daily activities, stiffness, all the non motor symptoms are normal, um, all the um, examination are fine. So, if it, this is a routine Parkinson's patient with like epidural traumas, stiffness, slowness, and there are lots and lots of 
meditations are available, which one will you choose? Somebody who is present in like a first time he is coming for you. He is, this is the first time he has not started any meditations. So the standard thing is start a finger pump, pass it in, choke. That's the thing. Or sometimes many people will start with European neural private control. But here, here, 10 years back, there was a study showed that the rasagelin has a neuroprotective effect. So that reduces the um, need for leoropa or dyskinesia. So leoropa should not be stopped, started earlier. That's all the concept here, here. But look at this study. If you look at this, in Italy, there is lots of neurologists are available. So they diagnose the Parkinson's very early and start the liver of around three years. In contrast, Ghana, there are no good doctors, so they diagnose the Parkinson's around five years. They start the liver of around six years. Both the varying of which when the tablet was started earlier, at some point of time the tablet will not be effective, so they require to give more medications. So around um, around five or five years, more medications required. Suddenly the discourse the abnormal dance like movements will stop. So this is the why Leonopo was not initially started, but here this is six and a half years, this is seven years. So the concept now is whether you start the Leonopo early or late, they will develop wearing off <coughs> and dyskinesias. So many people still are hesitant to start Leonopo earlier. They will say that Leonopo, no, no, no. If I start Leonopo, then I will get addicted. Lots of side effects will be there. So many patients are worried to start in the liver of power. So the concept is very, very clear now. It is very, very proved that the disease is the reason for the dyskinesia and the more medications. Not the starting the medications is not uh, really will not change the course of the disease. So next going to scenarios. Let's see. 16 years men, slow in their daily activities for six months to one year. So they said more of, uh, he told slightly was in around six months to one year. But more, they were very, very clear, six months, it's the onset. Bilateral slowness, slight tremors, but it was some numbness in the routine, left side, upper limb, and lower limb. He was referred to me for DVS. And he has a battle of diabetes and hypertension. Look at this. There is a slight, slight, small tremors in the hands. And also, if you look at this, there is a small tremor, slight tremor in the hands. Very, very slow in the movements. Typical <coughs> Parkinson's. Okay? So, but the, why they have referred to me is they have done a TODAR scan. Notice we, can, we have the TODAR scan in available. See, this is the TODAR scan. Sorry. You can see. This is a normal basal ganglia. But if the basal ganglia has reduced, the comma has become a full stop, this is Parkinson's disease. So we do this product scan to confirm if there is a doubt. If it is like this, we can say he doesn't have Parkinson's. If it is like a full stop is there, we clearly say he has a Parkinson's disease. This is our patients. We can see this side, it looks like a, almost the same comma shape. But here, a small full stop like this. So they diagnose this as a Parkinson's and refer to me. And they told that, see, for many Parkinson's disease patients, if they take the tablet, the tablet may not work properly. The reason, this is one of my patients came to Toronto to work with my boss. So he told that the tablet is not all working, tablet is not all working. So we asked for because many reasons, many times the H viral infection can reduce the absorption of the it may reduce absorption of liver of power. So we ask him to look for his copy. Even after one and a half hours, we can see the liver of power is still in the stomach full tablet. So in many Parkinson's disease patients, the tablet may not work properly, it may not get absorbed properly. That's why he was referred to us from the DBS, the same concept. But I was not happy because six months sudden onset of Parkinson's, that's what they told me. So I asked him to do the MRI. If you look at the MRI, you can see the side which the lopin is not, uh, uptake was not there, he has got a stroke, small stroke. But mainly it is the basal area and not affecting the motor area, that's why it doesn't have a weakness. So even though nowadays we have lots of, you can see this is a typical comma shape and this is the 
product the comma is absent here so even though nowadays we have more advanced technology the important thing is in neurology still the old school history and examination if you are correct in history and examination we can diagnose the patient otherwise i would have subjected him for advanced therapies so i told about dbs let us see what dbs is required somebody who requires more than five tablets of levolopa two hours of tablet is not working or one hour of abnormal movements in that case one we need to increase the tablets or we can go for an advanced therapies what is deep brain stimulation see deep brain stimulation is there for almost 25 to 30 years now like a heart pacemaker this is called as a brain pacemaker see this is the basal ganglia where the dopamine substantia nigra the dopamine is secreted if the dopamine secretion is reduced we will get parkinson's it's like a heart pacemaker whenever the heart pacemaker is whenever the heart doesn't work it will act or its action this is what to 24 hours on if there is a small battery here we will connect the small wires within the skin nothing is visible outside and we place two small electrodes in the brain like this the electrodes are pretty small you can see this is my finger you can see a small electrode small very very small this is a bigger one just like a my finger crease size of the finger crease we place it in a very very small electrode in the brain especially if a parkinson's we place it here or here in the subthalamic nucleus or GBA nucleus in the brain so who are the best candidates somebody who is a typical parkinson's like a tremor stiffness slowness difficulty in walking when the tablet is not working it will become off or lots of abnormal movements age less than 70 years somebody very very early we all treated with neuropower medications but above 4 years with 4 months of population they have a um, deep brain stimulation this is one of my patient you can see typical parkinson's he required almost he is 56 young onset parkinson's he was in spain he was a he was doing good business there when he developed parkinson's he was very really worried he was on 8 to 9 tablets of levodopa but when he takes a levodopa, the levodopa works for 1 half hours, not more than that. You can see how difficult for him to when the tablet is not working. He cannot lift the leg, he cannot move at all. He is, when the tablet is working well, he is absolutely fine. When the tablet is not working, he will have lots and lots of difficulty like this. He cannot move at all. But this is just after the after surgery. He is absolutely fine. Throughout the day, he doesn't have any off periods. Off periods, throughout the day, the tablet works well, the DBS works well in the background. He is absolutely fine. This is another patient. This gentleman came to me from Andhra. He told that he has got a lot of tremors. I asked him why, what is he doing, any tablets has been taken. He told that he has got a diabetes. Sugar, thank you for his side. Sugar is reduced, that's why she tremors are there. So he was three years, two, two to three years, he was not having the anti -blood. So it's just before the DBS, you have got seen how much tremors he has got it. After the DBS, you can see this one, this picture. So this is before the surgery, you can see how much tremors he has got. Significant tremors. He cannot do any work at all, but immediately after the surgery, you can see, there is absolutely no tremors. He has got a predominant tremor. <coughs> so we have published, like Toronto is one of the world's best center, I was trained, so we have published uh, how to, um, where to place the electrodes, everything we have published in Annals of Technology. We get it done. So we are just trying to place the target exactly within the subtalamic nucleus because the subtalamic nucleus is very, very small, like a peanut size. So we need to place it exactly inside the nucleus, but sometimes there is a chance it can go sideways like this. If it goes to sideways, you can see we need to place exactly like a peanut size till the very cutter size along. So if sometimes if we place in a little bit away, one millimeter away, you can see there is the side of a when I stimulate. The current can cross to the corticospinal tract and produces lots of side of pulling, tingling sensation, or very abnormal discomfort. Nowadays, with advanced technology, what we can do is what is called as a directional technology. Just we can change the stimulation. 
in the opposite direction. Only the side whichever with the side we want, and we can avoid the side cuts or we can use the side cuts. So this is the technology I'm talking about. Here, here you can see only one contact was there. Now it has become three contacts. So if the side effects are here, just I can tell student only one side of the brain. You can see. Just I can say student one side alone. See this side, it is less. Only the other side alone I can stimulate. So I can avoid the side effects in this direction. So the technology is very, very advanced nowadays. And nowadays we look into the brain. Earlier we used to, the technology is advanced. So we look into the brain waves inside the brain. See, if the beta waves, what we call the beta band in the brain, the beta, if the beta band is high, he is symptomatic. If the beta band is less, he is asymptomatic. We get like this. So in simple words, you can say, if the beta band is high, he is very, very slow, he cannot do, move, he cannot walk properly. With the stimulation, I can see, show that beta band is higher, reduces the beta band, automatically it's much better. So we can look into the brain. So we can see, earlier, we just programmed with, without seeing the patient. Now, we listen to the brain, what the brain says, how the brain works. We just program according to the brain. Phenomenal improvement what nowadays we are doing. And we can, with the technology, we can say whether I am over treating or I am treating less. Symptomatic, sorry, to reduce the beta band. This is normal. Or I am over treating. We can, I can plan accordingly. So, the next technology, what we have, is a form of form we have. Or injection. Like somebody for many Parkinson's patient, as I told you earlier, suddenly the tablet will not work. They cannot move. If they are going for a meeting like this, suddenly the tablet is not working. He cannot talk. He cannot move. So we have like insulin injection, we have the form of injection. Just take one injection, one shot, within five minutes the, uh, the injection will start its action. Then this is one of my patients. See, before the form of injection, is very, very slow. He cannot move at all, he is pretty slow. See how slow he is. This is just after the form of injection, within five, five minutes. Let's see the difference. Like what we do is, we do the upper market at the same time and ask them to take the tablet. So the tablet will take 41 minutes to 1 hour to add. Meanwhile, that bridge will be, this upper market will work as a bridge. So this will work when the tablet acts within 45 minutes to 1 hour, the upper market effect will go. So wherever they go, just take a shot, immediately they will be active. They can do it whatever the work they want. They can go for any have a shop, shopping or many times when they are having a difficulty, they will fall and lots of head injuries can occur that can be easily avoided. And now is what we have. This is somebody who is not willing for any GBS or home working. Nowadays the technology what we have is a focus ultrasound. The focus ultrasound is like it's there for a couple of years, 10 years. We produce a small lesion in the brain and produce a small a hole like this. Uh, this, this lesion reduces the tremors. It can work phenomenally well in the, just without opening, just send the, with the MRI machine, send the focus ultrasound waves to the brain and make a small lesion like this. So this is one of my patients from Toronto, you can see. He's got a lot of tremors before the surgery. And lots of tremors, both the hands. And this one after the surgery. No tremors at all, no need to open the brain. It's absolutely fine. But the disadvantage of this technology is with the deep brain stimulation, what we do, we can do it for both the sides. Most of the Parkinson's has symptoms on the both sides. But this focus ultrasound, you can do it for only one side, whenever the right other side. Tremors of home. But this will last for years, will last for like even I program for 15 20 years, they will respond well. This is short therapy because just we are not opening just uh, lesion, within five years the tremors can reoccur. But when the disease progresses, we can with deep brain stimulation, we can increase the current and they can have a good response. But this one, we cannot adjust the stimulation. Just once the surgery is done, that's it. So if we are going to the next scenario. 60 years man, 
abnormal deviation of the neck, he couldn't turn the neck, associated with pain, and others, everything is fine. This is the presentation. This is dystonia. Okay? So what tablets we try, but nowadays we give lots of Botox injection. Like the patients, the cervical dystonia can say that will be print or it can be back or the sides, any direction it can be. This is one of my patients, you can see. She has got a lot of abdominal. She has the, the important thing is she was treated with liosulfide, the gas tablet. Don't put it on liosulfide. Liosulfide is the culprit. It can produce this type of abdominal. The rabbit syndrome, mainly around the face, they can produce like this. This is just after the workouts. She has got a phenomenal Around the face, sir, here. Here, around the eyes, on the mouth, and the couple of muscles here. So she has got a good improvement. Tell me the dose about Sure, sure. And this is dystonia. This is a young lady. Sorry. Yeah, you can see this is a young lady who is an IT, IT professional. She has got a dystonia. She cannot move the neck to the sides. She cannot do any work at all. Even drive, she's a, a team leader, she cannot do anything. This is before the surgery, DB surgery, this is after the surgery. The neck is absolutely straight. And this is one of another patient, another dystonia. You can see the body is going back, arched backwards to the sides as well. And you can see the leg is also like extended like this. He cannot walk anything, he cannot go to do any work, even for washroom, he requires uh, some support. This is after the surgery. Is absolutely fine. So, now he was very happy that he can walk alone. Now he wanted to show that for years after he can run also nowadays. <laughs> year earlier, he was not only able to walk, he was absolutely happy. He was saying, sir, you gave me the new life. I can walk alone, I can do everything nowadays. He was pretty happy nowadays. So next case, 40 more years when he has got abnormal teaching in the face, or the teaching around the mouth. So you can see this one. This is what he has got. He was literally impressed. This we see for many people, like a teaching of the eyes. He will come and say, Sir, I cannot go and talk to any lady. Hmm. If I talk, they think that I am doing something with problems. So I am really impressed, I am really worried. So he used to avoid talking to ladies and also people also thinking what he's doing. And after that, what else? Does it have that? Moments at all. So this is called as a hemifacial spasm. It gives a very good response to the new patient's person. So she is a 64 year woman, got a COVID positive. As you said, this, this case came during the COVID time. She got a breathlessness, treated with steroid for five days, and discharged. But long day she came with alter behavior, one episode of seizures. At the time, her sugars are 600, and she was treated with liver pill and then insulin infusion because sugars are high. So we thought that, okay, this is a hyperglycemia induced seizures. We just treated with uh, um, uh, insulin on the medication. But next day I went in for a, uh, I'm covering for my colleague. Look at the eyes. Look at the eyes. What's happening? This is not nystagmus. Nystagmus usually on the sides at first. But this jumps in the all the direction. It goes up and down, sides, everywhere it is jumping. So I was surprised. Wow, what is this? <laughs> what is happening? So this is called as an opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome. So when they came, I was surprised. Usually we think about yeah, malignancy in the abdomen. So we have done a PET scan, we have done all the autoimmune workup, we have done a CSF, we have done a paraneoplastic workup. Everything is negative. And we don't know what is why, what is the reason. Everything is negative. So you can see there is a jerking of the hands, myoclonus was there, very, very unstable, very sick at the time. So at the time only one presentation has came. So it was COVID induced. We see lots of Parkinson's dystonia. This is one of the rare presentations. We treated with IVIG. After the IVIG, you can see immunoglobulins, IV immunoglobulins. She has become better. So, COVID can produce any number of problems. She is absolutely fine. So, we have, this, we have presented this case, we have published, and only 16 cases were described at the time. So, within all the patients that were IVIG or steroid, most of the patients responded well to immunoglobulins. The last case is a 16-year-old boy. Sometimes he told an abnormal movement. 
Initially, they told that he was treated as ticks. Some people treated as uh, epilepsy. And he came to, the parents were very concerned. Sir, my pa it was treated for almost eight years. Still, it is there. I don't know what to do. Somebody to uh, refer to you. So let us see what a movement disorder specialist. This is also epilepsy. I told them. Um, I see everything, but it was a tick. It's a childhood ticks. So childhood ticks without treat. Just a, uh, like a, when the disease progresses, when the patient age grows, when he's becoming automatically, they know what to do, they avoid the ticks automatically. They are more conscious. But anyhow, this guy, you can see, he's a, I asked, examined him. He was absolutely fine, he was absolutely normal. No, no problem at all. I told them, I reassured them, nothing has happened, this just ticks, don't do anything, just go home. But when he got up from the chair, I saw this one. You can see. He got up and he got up. I asked him to run. Then I asked him to run. I saw something like this. When he got up from the chair, suddenly, see the hands. What is happening? It's a dancing. Just for seconds. That's it. He's improved. He's not. Just 15 seconds to 20 seconds. That's it. Just it was like a dancing like this. This is not happening. So many people thought that this was a tick, this is a epilepsy. Epilepsy means that you should lose the consciousness. So many people thought this is a simple partial seizures that did as okay, three drugs he was on. So I was saying, wow, this is a rare condition. So I sent a genetics for him. Genetics showed it's a PRRT gene. So this is a movement induced. Like suddenly whenever they move, they will develop this type of abnormal moods. What is called as a paroxysmal kinesogenic dyskinesia or chorea. This is a chorea. So this is a, not a movement disorder. This is a movement-induced movement disorder. <laughs> Suddenly when you get up, he does. So just I started with a carbozepin, he responded phenomenally. And this patient, as I told you about epilepsy, this patient came to me suddenly. Recurrent frequently, they are having uh, seizures. So I thought of whenever they get a fight, immediately they will develop seizures like this. So I kept a tuning fork, I told her I wanted to see the epilepsy, then only I can treat properly, I tricked her. So when I keep that tuning fork, I told her when I think the epilepsy, even epilepsy will come out. See, I tricked her immediately, she got epilepsy. See, she is not responding, suddenly hand also falls. This is a typical epilepsy she has got. Every time, whenever there is a fight in the home, she will get epilepsy. Now, I kept a tuning fork on the side. I told that I am keeping that, I am taking out the current out. I push the current inside. Now I am going to take the current out. She has become normal. So, just like trick it. So, what is this? Magic, sir. <laughs> <laughs> just a second. Thank you. Magic, sir. So, I have showed lots and lots of moments all this time. But this is the final moment I am going to show you. Can anyone diagnose what is this moment? This is very, very abnormal. Nobody can mimic this one. See, what is the neck movement? Is that? Korea, Korea, sir, Korea. Abnormal. See, exercise in this Korea. So, this is very, very abnormal. And nobody in the world, my boss is one of the world's best part in the movement, sir, especially. Even he told that I cannot treat this patient. <laughs> Thank you. So the final question is, when I joined that, I told that neurology is very boring, but now neurology has evolved and we do a lot of, lot of advanced therapies. Do you agree? Thank you. Passion since her undergraduation and uh, uh, she is pursuing that very well. And uh, presently she is working as senior consultant in Sims Hospital. Good evening everybody. After listening to all the latest technologies, I'm going to back I'm going to go back in time to other basics. So
post panel sessions would be like this, but I find a lot of Thank you, thank you again, sir. Thank you. 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 I'm really grateful throughout my life for that. Uh, today I'm going to talk about robotics and neurology. So, uh, robotics is coming in a big way and almost uh, every uh, corporate hospital is uh, buying one and uh, the implications for robotic surgery is increasing. The uh, surgery being done and robotics is also increasing. So, today I'm going to give a talk about where it is essential. So, basic introduction about how the robotics works and where it is essential. <coughs> so, this is the Davinci fourth generation robot. And uh, what we have here is the uh, central processing unit. This is the uh, patient cart and this is the surgeon's console. So, the surgeon can sit comfortably and operate and uh, the movement of the surgeon's hand will be ex means exactly transmitted in the tip of the robotic instruments which is launched in the robotic arms. So this is the surgeon's console. This is the 3D uh, stereoscopic vision provider which helps in the depth of perception. And only two master controls are there but the surgeon has four hands to operate. Unlike in conventional laparoscopic uh, and open surgeries, the robotic surgeon has literally four arms. So, but only two robot master con consoles, sorry. Only two master controls are there. So, how uh, he can uh, operate with the four arms is with the help of the clutches, what is shown in the foot switch pedal. There we have a camera clutch as well as the swab pedal. So, whenever the camera clutch is pressed, the surgeon's uh, hand movements will be uh, uh, managing only the camera arm. And uh, when the swap pedal is pressed, we can uh, switch over from one instrument to the other. So superior ergonomics uh, lets the surgeon operate uh, for a longer time and the complex surgeries without any uh, physical fatigue. So this is the four arms of the robot, sorry. This is the four arms of the robot and this is just like a laparoscopic ports. Uh, just 8 millimeter incisions are made and the ports are made and uh, the arms of the robot will be attached to this ports and the robotic arms uh, means uh, robotic instruments will be latched to it. So this is the most interesting part about the robotic instruments. 
So this is how, this is exactly the size of the robotic instrument. The one inch, uh, sorry, uh, one to two inch of the tip of the instruments exactly mimics the 10 inch hand, uh, 10 inch size of the hands of the surgeon. So this is the endless technology where the tip of the uh, instrument can be moved like uh, 7 degrees of freedom of movements will be there. So this image shows the exact uh, movement of the surgeon being transmitted to the robotic instrument tips. So this uh, tip of the instrument which is 7 mm acts like a fingers of the surgeon and this is like a metacarpocarpal joint and this one will be like a wrist. So exactly the hands of the movements are uh, transmitted to the tip of the instruments. So laparoscopic and robotics the difference which I have already told in addition to that the only disadvantage of robot is the absence of tactile feedback which the surgeon will be able to overcome by learning the visual cues. So in laparoscopy if you zoom in too much to see the details of the uh, details of the things, then uh, at that time the instruments cannot do the surgery because of the clashing with the camera. But in case of robotic surgery, you have a stable vision because the, once you clutch the camera, it won't move at all. It remains stable and the surgeon's instruments can move without clashing with the instrument, uh, clashing with the camera. And here what we are seeing is the plane between the prostate which is above and the rectum which is below. The space is literally very minimal which you may not be able to see at all. Uh, most of the open surgeries we will do it as a blind, a blind swiping of the swiping with the finger. And in laparoscopy even if you do this you will have a clashing of the instruments with the pubic bones. So in la as I told you laparoscopy only two instruments can be used. But in case of robotic, see this is the third arm which uh, is using to, uh, which is used to retract and uh, the other two working elements can be used after retracting. So when uh, you need to retract further, the surgeon can again readjust the third arm to uh, get a better field of vision to work with. As I already told you, the pubic bones in the closed spaces, in the closed cavities like pelvis, uh, especially in prostatic surgery as well as in the bladder surgeries, the movement of the laparoscopic instruments are restricted by the pubic bone. Here, I want you to concentrate on the movement of this instrument, uh, left hand instrument. Here, I am dissecting the prostatic urethra. This is the prostate. And uh, this is the uh, dorsal venous complex and what we see here is the pubic bone. This space is literally very difficult to see itself in open surgeries and in laparoscopic surgeries we cannot do this manual like how we are doing in robotic surgery. So the standard of care for uh, prostatic malignancy uh, is uh, means uh, localized to prostate cancer is a radical prostatectomy in that too robotic is the standard way of doing the procedure. As I told you, there is no tactile feedback in robotics, but we can see the visual cues. Like uh, here, we are tying the suture, and whether it is tight or not, we can make it by seeing the color. Sorry, by seeing by seeing the coloring in the suture. Here, dorsal venous complex is being tied. It's a leash of uh, venous uh, sinuses, and when we tie. It is not tightened. And this is the third retracting instrument using uh, to make the dorsal venous complex prominent. After releasing it, I am able to tighten it better and we can see the coloring there. <coughs> that tactile sensation is better uh, seen in means felt in uh, laparoscopic surgeries. Here we are able to see the coloring of the suture. So it is tightened now. So those visual cues we will learn once we do more. So how do minimal, minimal uh, blood loss in robotics? The same surgery we are doing in open surgery and laparoscopic surgery but the blood loss is minimal in robotic. How it is possible? Here you are seeing this minor blood vessels. This may not be seen 
in open surgeries and in laparoscopic surgeries even if it, if we see we just ignore but it is so magnified in robotic surgery that even a drop of blood will make you feel as if it is bleeding and we uh, attend to it immediately here uh, what we are doing is a robotic uh, intrapetoral intro dissection and that is being done for uh, testicular malignancy right side testis and here uh, I am dissecting the paracaval nodes what we see here is the IVC inferior vena cava and here is the duodenum with its peristalsis and here we, you can see the ureter peristalsis of the ureter here so negative margins in cancer surgeries the one another surgery where it is essential is uh, partial nephrectomy as we all know one fourth of the uh, cardiac output goes to the uh, kidney and in that taking uh, dissecting a tumor out of the kidney in spite of its high vascularity and reconstructing is really very difficult in open surgery and uh, here you can clearly see the tumor margin here it is a bad tumor and I am trying to readjust the margins by going one layer of uh, taking one layer of normal renal parenting So here, uh, almost uh, the tumor uh, margin is re reaching the capsule. The listening area, what you are seeing is the renal capsule, the other end of the tumor. Capsule being cut and the tumor is resected out completely. So visibly this is the renal parenchyma and the tumor which with its uh, glistening layer of capsule is left means taken up completely. This is the feeder. What you are seeing here is the feeder vessel to the tumor. So this is the technology to check the viability of the structures in real time. So whenever we do uh, cancer surgeries like in uh, uh, bladder removal, after removing the bladder we reconstruct uh, the new bladder using a segment of bubble. After taking the segment of bubble, the ureters are anastomosed to the bubble segment and the end to end anastomosis of the bladder to the resume its continuity is done. So the main thing which we are worried about after such reconstruction is the vascularity of that area of anastomosis. Here in real time, after finishing the anastomosis or before starting the anastomosis itself, we can give a fluorescent dye and see the vascularity. Now here what we are seeing is the anastomotic line and we can see the leash of blood vessels on either side of the anastomosis. So the surgeon can sleep peacefully at night not worried about the leak. So where robot is essential? So in pelvic organs, where it is very difficult to access in open surgeries as well as in laparoscopic surgeries, like radical prostatectomy, the, where the plane between the prostate and rectum, this is the most uh, intricate step and that is the only structure which we are worried about in uh, robotic prostatectomies, the injury to the rectum. That can be well seen and avoided in uh, robotic surgeries. And dorsovenous complex, uh, which I showed the suturing, uh, suturing of that, the venous complex, which is very, very difficult to access and this is a nightmare for every urologist who are doing the radical prostatectomy by open or laparoscopic approach. And the anastomosis, I didn't show the video, but uh, as it's the anastomosis in that area, it is very, very difficult and only stay sutures and only four sutures will be done in open surgeries. And in laparoscopic surgeries, the pubic bone uh, remains a very, uh, means, pro, pro, uh, it's a big hurdle to that anastomosis in that area. And which is very comfortably uh, done in uh, robotic surgeries, like you are doing it in the surface with, the, with your own hands. So, uh, next in partial nephrectomy, as I uh, showed the visualization of a tumor margins, not only that, 
in uh, complex hilar tumors where the tumor is located close to the sorry where the tumor is located close to the hilum by visualizing and uh, uh, taking uh, only adequate margins necessary for give clearance we can preserve the major vessels and preserve the kidney especially in ckd patients and uh, the diabetic patients who are prone for ckd at later date and uh, uh, as I showed you, the reconstructive surgeries, we can be sure of the vascularity and very delicate handling of the tissues can be done better with the robot. So, uh, general, our general notion is like a robotic surgery, so, uh, even if it is a uh, layman, uh, even uh, my colleagues uh, think that robotic surgery are too costly. But yeah, initially when the laparoscopy comes into picture, the cost difference between the laparoscopy and the conventional open surgeries was high. But uh, gradually it came down and uh, insurance, uh, insurance departments uh, uh, provided the guidelines that insurance should not be denied for robotic surgeries. And uh, especially in a rob a robotic radical prostatectomy and partial nephrectomy where it is essential. And in reconstructive surgeries where it is essential, they are giving 100% coverage for the insurance, including the central government uh, insurances. Thank you for giving the opportunity. No, sir. Uh, almost the same time. Uh, it, you can finish it up a little earlier when compared to laparoscopic surgery, and when compared to open surgery, at most similar thing. Uh, for radical prostatectomy, it will be taking around uh, 3 to 3 and a half hours. And uh, for other surgeries, it depends on the location of the tumor. So for uh, easy partial nephrectomy, like I showed in the picture, where it is a polar tumor and smaller tumor, it can be finished up in uh, 1 and a half hours. Like like no, no, sir. It's like laparoscopic, sir. Like even smaller than that. Only 8 millimeter incisions will be there. Just like laparoscopic, Just like laparoscopic surgery. Laparoscopic surgery, surgery is close to the patient. Robotic surgery, surgery is away from the patient. Not only that, sir, as I told you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had.